Good morning and welcome to this virtual presentation of our traditional York County Day event. I'm Amanda Stewart of Winthrop University and I've served as co-chair of the York County Day Planning Committee in recent years and while our perspectives are a little bit different right now, I'm happy to welcome you all virtually as we continue to seek and celebrate partnerships between business, government, and community. Before we get started, I want to recognize our legislative delegation. You'll hear from some of them today and others will be featured in upcoming virtual highlights. I also want to thank our local governments who consistently take time to hear and recognize the needs of our business community, especially during the last year. York County Day has been hosted each year as a partnership of all chambers in York County. Those include the Greater Clover Chamber, the Lake Wiley Chamber, and the Regional Chamber, which serves Fort Mill, TK, Rock Hill, and York. I know that many watching today serve as board members and volunteers for these organizations. We really appreciate you and your support. We also want to recognize our sponsors for this program, many of whom support our advocacy efforts throughout the year. All sponsor names will be displayed between sessions today, so you'll be able to see them, and they'll also be posted on the Regional Chambers event page at yorkcountychamber.com slash YCD. Our top-level sponsors for today's program are Comporium, Domtar, Founders Federal Credit Union, and York County Government. The York County Day program began 33 years ago as a reminder to decision makers in Columbia that while we are located very close to Charlotte, we are very much a valuable part of South Carolina. This program has evolved quite a lot since that time, and as part of today's program, we've included some remarks from a few of our most famous community leaders who had a vision for what York County could be. As you heard, the goals laid out by the very first York County Day Organizing Committee were to gain recognition, recognition at the state level, to seek assistance from Columbia in addressing the challenges of our geographic location and to rally our community in order to not only grow but also to thrive. In many ways, we have met those goals and may have even exceeded the expectations of those visionary first leaders. Moving forward, the York County Day program will experience a name change and a refocus in future years, but with your continued involvement as representatives of business and government, our ongoing mission remains the same. Now please enjoy this highlight video spotlighting the history and value of the York County Day program. Following the video, we'll hear from the head of our York County delegation and House Speaker Pro Tem, the Honorable Tommy Pope, and then Rick Duran, Chairperson of the Regional Chambers Government Relations Task Force, will lead us into our very first session today. Well, York County Day, you really have to go back to 1984. 1984. I was a candidate for the state house. And part of my talk was to uh, suggest that, uh, you know, I'll, you know, a candidate's promise that if I'm elected, uh, I'm going to have the chambers of York County to band together and have a York County day, which I thought was a good idea, but apparently it wasn't since West won the election. <laughs> uh, but I, a couple of years later, I was uh, elected, selected to go on the chamber board. That was in 87. And then was selected to be the VP of government relations on the chamber board. And so um, one of my goals was to, and we did produce the first York County Day in 1988. The beginnings were lost in the mist of time. This is, uh, we're talking 40, 45 years ago, late 70s. Bayless Mack was an attorney, then I think was on the Highway Commission then. But he and I were the, the two people we knew who were spending a larger than routine amount of time working the legislature and spending time with the legislative people in Columbia. And what we were hearing was not complimentary about York County. I remember calling down to Columbia once to talk with the secretary or the director of consumer affairs for the state of South Carolina. And I talked with uh, his uh, secretary or receptionist or whoever. He wasn't available, so she was gonna take my name and number. And back in those days, South Carolina only had one area code. And the lady asked me for my telephone number and I gave her my telephone number. Uh, which I can still remember from the, the bank where I was working. And uh, she said, and she asked me, she said, what area code is that in? I said, young lady. And she was probably older than I was because I was 25 at the time. 
I said, I told you I was from Rock Hill. Rock Hill is in South Carolina. We all had the same area code. And I realized then that a lot of people working in state government didn't know Rock Hill was in South Carolina. And uh, so when we went down to York County Day, that was something that I always tried to remind people of, that even though we're close to Charlotte and we're in the Charlotte metro region, uh, we're in South Carolina. And, and we need the, uh, to reap the benefits of being in South Carolina. Uh, so that was part of the message that we, we gave out. The purpose really was we realized, gosh, we're, we're up here in uh, York County. Uh, a lot of people in Columbia consider us in North Carolina or you're in the Charlotte sphere of, of business. So, you know, we, we, didn't, we, we didn't feel like we were even being, being heard or people even knew where we were. So we decided or it was decided that the best thing to do was to make an effort to go to Columbia, at least on an annual, annual basis, invite the legislature to, and the governor to, to lunch uh, and to activities, uh, evening activities, and use then the, uh, the morning and afternoon for different programs on key issues that were important to the state and important to York County. And we, we had, we've had incredible success over the years of bringing the key, the key folks from particularly, uh, particularly uh, state agencies that were extra important to us, be it the, uh, the old highway department, the Department of Transportation, uh, environmentally, DHEC, to meet with DHEC, uh, so many business, so many business concerns, whether it's Department of Labor and so forth, to bring those officials to come make presentations at York County Day, get input from York County, answer uh, questions from York County citizens. York County Day, I think, did a lot to solidify uh, the chambers in York County. Uh, it helped us when we got to the point that it was beneficial to consolidate those chambers uh, because places like Fort Mill, TKK, York, Clover, they have tremendous community pride. And when we started talking about merging those, uh, those chambers together, uh, York County Day had actually opened that door for us to, to, for all of us to see that we could benefit by working together on more of the things than we did. Uh, and it was a process that we went through to get to the point of having a regional chamber. Uh, but that's a whole nother program for you. Greetings from the York County delegation. This is Tommy Pope. I am currently the chair of the delegation. Uh, for you guys and uh, ladies that were in the military, you know how that works. Uh, apparently Ray Felder, who is our secretary now, and I were not paying attention when they asked for volunteers. And Mr. Clymer, Mr. Simmel, and everyone took a step backwards, and so now here I am in leadership. Uh, it, I'm excited to be here with you today. It was kind of scary when she was mentioning the number of years we've had uh, York County Day because I think I've been involved uh, uh, for all of them. I was uh, back in 91, I was in uh, leadership York County. I was a deputy working at the sheriff's office. Um, little did I know then that two of my classmates, uh, Gary Simrel and Ray Felder, we would go on years later to serve uh, down in Columbia in the legislature. Um, when I was elected solicitor, I would go to Columbia, and I was solicitor uh, in the 90s through uh, the mid-2000s. I would go to Columbia advocating for things uh, for York County, whether it was financing for the solicitor's office, changing laws, other things. Um, and what I saw when we got to Columbia is when Columbia looked north up I-77, they saw Charlotte. And so we were a bedroom community for Charlotte as far as they were concerned. And uh, it, it really felt like we didn't get the attention that I thought our area deserved. I will tell you, since I went to the legislature in 2010, I've seen that change significantly. I think uh, it is in part to the work that uh, the chambers have done, the members of the community have done, the growth. Because um, it's always been a battle, as you know, of defining that state line to make sure we weren't part of Charlotte but stood alone while gaining the benefits, and I think that's been done well. I can tell you now in the last 10 years in serving with the members that we have in Columbia, 
York County is recognized. They're recognized financially. They're recognized from economic development. Uh, the, the work we saw with the Panthers uh, the last couple years shows that they're willing to help in York County much like they always did in the larger areas like Charleston and Columbia and so forth. So I look forward to what we learned today. I look forward to how we'll go forward. Um, I hope you have a good day, a good meeting, and again, uh, um, we're glad to be here. I know you're probably happy to not be in Columbia trying to track us down kind of like herding cats, so we're glad you got us as a captive audience today, and we look forward to the program. Thank you. And thank you very much, Speaker Pro Tem Tommy Pope. Always a pleasure hearing from you, and thank you for all you're doing in Columbia for us. We appreciate your insight, and we certainly look forward to hearing from you again later today. Good morning, everyone. I am Rick Duran. I am Rick Duran, and I am Vice President of Local Government and Community Relations for Duke Energy in South Carolina. And I'm here today as the chair of the Regional Chambers Government Relations Task Force. And it is certainly my pleasure to volunteer to serve on that board and to chair it. I'll be your guide during this transportation session. And this session is sponsored by York County Government, a great partner of the York Regional Chamber of Commerce. Now you could be watching this session on Facebook, YouTube, the Chamber website, but what I really need is your questions. There is a question box out of all of those sites. Please type in your questions. I've already got some coming in, so I'm looking forward to sharing those questions and we'll get to as many as, of those as we can by the end of the session. But what I'd like to do right now is start off with a few remarks from Jerry Helms. Jerry Helms is one of our fabulous partners out at Carowinds, and he was instrumental on keeping us focused on transportation needs. And he was there from the very beginning with Pennies for Progress when it was born. So let's see a video from Jerry. Once upon a time, we were not well known in Columbia. They didn't understand it. Thanks to a great legislative delegation a wonderful Chamber of Commerce who've worked tirelessly with government relations time and time again, who have spearheaded organizing the promotion of the Pennies for Progress campaigns. We find ourselves at the beginning of one of the golden ages for this county. And I'm just excited that I paid, played a little tiny part of it, but more importantly, I'm grateful that I got to know so many wonderful people because this county is, is the best. It's my home and I believe in it, but I also believe in preparing for the future. And that's, that's the transportation story. It's, it's a story of good people coming together to develop a vision and mission and working to make it happen. We were pioneers. There were no manuals. We didn't have a compass. There wasn't even a path to follow. We had to, to figure it out. And uh, so we did. We relied on the county. And we got a group from the chamber and chambers and came to Rock Hill and we talked and we came up with, with, with some roads. It was very tough. People had been disappointed for so long because government would promise to do something and either wouldn't do it or would spend the funds on something else. So we had to overcome that. I can say to somebody in Rock Hill, there's a road that needs to be built to protect the school children 
in clover. And they'll say, oh, that's great. That's a wonderful idea. But on the voting day, the kids may have a soccer game or you may need a haircut or your mom might call, your mom or grandma might call and need a trip to the grocery store. You go, that's good. I'll do this. So the first one with a good idea is cellar building. But if that road my kids are riding on are my relatives or my neighbors, then I know what I get for it. And that's votability. And it's the right thing to do. So in the, that commission, we changed it. We got, in, got involvement. People had seen the orange barrels, which became sort of the county symbol. And they saw and got to ride on the roads by then. We won by 62 and a half percent. One of the reasons I do this was like so many people, I, I, I lost someone I love very much because of an accident, my father. And um, story I need to tell so, so people would hear, when we were doing the 2003 campaign, and there was still some resistance, we were at a, an elementary school. And as fate would have it, the highway patrolman that my dad knew that responded when he was killed uh, was very skeptical. You know, from there, he said, I don't know, I don't, th and he said, I don't think it will happen. And he asked, and I said, well, I'm glad you asked that question. And that's when I explained that pennies had to be spent, and the county council couldn't change it, they could either vote yes or no, that it went for seven years or until the money was, was, was uh, gathered up and it would end early, but it would never change. And I don't know why I said this, maybe I thought of my dad. But I said, listen, the one thing that we get, the greatest benefit that we get for voting to make our roads safer is something we'll never know. And that's the names of the lives that will be spared. One of the commissioners put his hand on my back and said, that's perfect. That's exactly right. I get it now. There's no way we can lose this. This is too important. Got lucky. Don't know why I said it, but I said it in a minute. And that's why I still do it, because I care, you know. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Wes Clymer. It's good to be with you this morning. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Chamber for the extraordinary work that you do across a, a range of important civic endeavors in our community. And in particular, I want to plug the incredible work y'all have done at the vaccine clinic uh, over at the Galleria recently. I was there last week. It is amazing to see the number of people who are getting vaccinated there, the number of volunteers rolling through there. And so thank you. Um, I just uh, am really impressed and grateful for the, the incredible work the Chamber has done on behalf of that uh, very important project here. So. All right, turning to the matter at hand, which is, which is our favorite subject, I think, or at least the one that comes up the most any time I host a town hall meeting, and that is roads. Um, I want to tell a quick story. My, my in-laws uh, moved here from Texas a couple years ago, and they're from a kind of rural part of Texas, and they were really confused when they were driving around because they say in Texas, if something's 10 miles, it's 10 minutes. If it's 20 miles away, it's 20 minutes. But in Rock Hill and Fort Mill, if it's 10 miles away, it could be 10 minutes or it could be two hours. And, and that speaks to um, our congestion problem, our, our traffic problem. And I think we all know that um, with the massive influx in population, that, that problem's not going to um, abate uh, anytime soon. But there are some meaningful investments that we can make and that are underway that I want to highlight in our time together this morning. And to begin with, uh, I want to pull up a slide uh, from the uh, RFATS. Is that the slide that's on? Okay, so what we're looking at here, this is um, a, a 2015 slide from RFATS that shows our transportation network in York County. And every one of those little red areas is a 
demonstrates an area of our transportation network that is, I don't know if this is the, the scientific term, but functionally obsolete, which is to say there is more traffic moving along that road than the road can reasonably handle, right? So flipping to the next side. All right, this is a forecast of our, of our future. And I think many of you who have attended uh, various transportation planning meetings over the years will probably recall seeing this slide a time or two. What this shows you here, all those red areas, are if we build everything that is currently on the uh, long-range transportation plan, which is significant, this is what we can look forward to into the future by virtue of the fact that we have such extraordinary population growth. And we're at a point now where we simply cannot outbuild that growth. But blessedly, uh, there is some relief on the way. And so if you will, please turn to the PowerPoint presentation. I wanted to highlight a few uh, projects, significant projects that will uh, serve to alleviate traffic congestion, uh, particularly around the I-77 corridor and the major thoroughfares, the, the east-west thoroughfares that connect to I-77. Um, we all know that the, the Gold Hill Road project, ex Exit 88, is underway. We'll soon have a new interchange, I call it the, the Eden Terrace interchange, to serve the, the Panthers project, but also bifurcate traffic off of Exit 82, which is the uh, 161 Cherry Road um, interchange. So that will get underway later this year and wrap up in 2023. And then a huge project, and I should point out, we'll look at all of these in a little bit uh, more detail on subsequent slides, a, a huge project that has been on the top of everyone's minds in York County for quite some time is a, a fundamental rethinking of the interchange at 160, exit 85. And then we'll look out a little bit further into 2026, 2027, is when we reasonably anticipate uh, seeing a really a whole lot of work on the the Selenese Cherry Road interchange. All right, so next slide, we'll start looking at these in a little bit greater depth. Uh, and I should note that all of these interchange projects um, are supported substantially by uh, the county's successful application to the State Transportation Infrastructure Bank and want to put in a plug for our very own Gary Simrel, who serves on that board. Gary, thank you for your help there. But it's been a team effort. The, the chamber's been involved. The county's been involved. Lots of hands in this project. And um, it's great to finally see significant state investment in the, the, the locus of our congestion and uh, transportation frustration along I-77. So the Gold Hill project, as you can see, is underway. It should be substantially completed by this fall. Next slide. All right, and then the big one at I-77 and 160, this is a, a huge project. As you can see, see the math there, it's more than $75 million. Uh, right away acquisition is underway. Uh, construction should begin next year. And that is a, a project that, you know, uh, I know in particular having sat on RFATS for a couple years, a lot of time, effort, and energy has gone into designing a new interchange model uh, that can serve not only the traffic we have today, uh, but the traffic that is expected to arrive over the next couple decades as our population continues to balloon. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so there's sort of a fancy looking diagram. Uh, we're all familiar with um, sort of the, the nature of uh, the way that the, the traffic is uh, concentrated on that interchange currently at Selenese and Cherry. And as you see out into the future, again, 2026 is when the construction is expected to begin. Uh, that's gonna get shifted in some fairly significant ways. And again, that's a, that's a, a very big project that will make a huge difference uh, in, in our AM and PM commutes uh, to and from work. All right, so next slide, please. And then a new interchange coming in between Exit 82, that's uh, the Selenese Cherry Interchange, and Dave Lyle, a little bit down the road, will be what I call the Eden Terrace Interchange. And as you see there, that, that's sort of a preliminary rendering of, of the manner in which this interchange will be constructed. Uh, and you can look at the, see the various funding sources there. Federal government uh, put some money in, the Department of Commerce put some in, local match, and of course the Panthers too. Uh, that contract uh, has been awarded, and we expect that interchange to be completed uh, by the spring of 2023. Um, importantly, and, and the, the picture really doesn't do it justice, and, and uh, this is something that I've spent a good bit of time talking with DOT about, um, 
that picture doesn't demonstrate really the degree to which that interchange will be connected with other thoroughfares in the, in the area. It really will be um, an, an interchange that serves much more than the Panthers complex. And if we get a better rendering in the future, I'll get that up online on Facebook or something like that. Um, all right, next slide, please. Another huge, huge project that um, SCDOT has been working on for many years, and this is incredibly important for Western New York County and unlocking, unlocking a lot of economic opportunity on the western side of the county, is the widening of I-85 from the North Carolina line down to Georgia. And I know for all the, the Clemson fans on the, on the conference this morning, uh, y'all are probably the most anxious uh, to see this project completed. But it is, it is very much underway and is a, a, just an enormous project that, again, uh, over time will unlock an extraordinary amount of economic opportunity on the, on the western side of the county. Uh, next slide. And then I think Brent Ruiz, um, who represents SCDOT and is going to be on in a little while, is going to spend a little bit more time on this slide, but I wanted to highlight uh, this to you, if you go to the SCDOT website, you can locate this map, it's just the project viewer, and you can click on any one of those little highlighted areas um, and see, a, see the projects that are ongoing in your county. And so I don't know the degree to which the, the text there is visible, but you can see we have some resurfacing projects, have some widening projects, bridge projects. There's just a whole lot of work underway in, in a lot of different areas. Um, and again, I, I think that uh, Brent will, will spend a good bit more time with this slide as his presentation unfolds. And so that covers substantially um, the state-funded road projects that are uh, on the horizon or underway. I should mention one more. Uh, that I think that the effects of which we may already be experiencing to some degree, and that is the replacing the bridge deck on the I-77 bridge. Um, my uh, children and I like to go kayaking down the Catawba River uh, and a good bit in the summer, and it's always kind of terrifying, or has been over the last few years, to float underneath that I-77 bridge over the Catawba and look up and be able to see daylight through that bridge deck. And so... It'll be, a, it'll be a huge hassle while the bridge deck is being replaced. That project should conclude by the end of May, uh, but hopefully with the completion of that project, we won't have that sort of episodic, um, you know, a, a random road work project here, random road work project there uh, to, to keep the bridge deck operable. It'll be a brand new bridge deck that can, that can serve that traffic load for, for years to come. And, uh, hopefully make that a little bit of safer place uh, for people to get on and off of the interstate. All right, and thus concludes my update on transportation projects. Look forward to speaking with you further during the Q&A. As always, if you have any questions or there's anything I can do to help, please send me an email at westclimber at sccenate.gov or call me on my cell phone at 803-752-0052. Thanks so much. And thank you very much, uh, Senator Clymer. Always a pleasure uh, seeing you. Of course, I don't see you right now because I am actually virtual. I'm sitting in a side office, but it was good to uh, wave to you in the hallway as you were taking your spot. And thank you as well for everything that you're doing in Columbia. And I'm looking forward to uh, having a discussion uh, later in the session this morning. But before we do that, our next guest is Deputy Secretary Brent Ruiz with South Carolina Department of T Transportation, SCDOT. And he also has a presentation that he'll be sharing with us. Brent? Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, look forward to giving this presentation to you this morning. Uh, let me share my screen, get the presentation up. 
Right now it's showing it's uh, disabled if somebody would turn it on. So I'll go ahead and get started until they um, get get the presentation or, or disable it uh, so I can get the presentation up. But uh, let, let's start with the bottom line up front. Um, one, we're well on our way of getting the, the state of our roads in a, in a state of good repair. That, that being said, uh, we have not uh, solved the issue of congestion throughout the state, and that's, a, that's an ongoing problem. Um, uh, some may be surprised, but some of you may know, we actually have the fourth largest uh, highway system in the nation. Um, uh, that being said, that's coupled with, we are also the sixth fastest growing state in the nation. Um, I'm sure you're seeing uh, a big residential boom up in the York County area as we are here in Columbia, if, if not more. I'll try to share the screen one more time. There we go. Hopefully everybody's able to see that. Um, so, 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 so moving on, um, at July of 2020, uh, if you recall, uh, excuse me, uh, in 2017, uh, Act 40 was passed. That's for the gas tax increase of 12 cents phased in over six years. Um, our current, we are currently in year four. Uh, our current gas tax rate is 24.75 cent. At full implementation, it will be at 28.75 cent. Um, that being said, it's still, uh, still below our neighboring states, Georgia and North Carolina. Uh, a little fun fact is uh, one cent uh, of gas tax generates approximately $34 million in revenue. All right, so let's talk orange cones. Hopefully y'all see an orange cones up in y'all's area as well. Uh, we're putting that money to work. We've dramatically increased our work program. Um, we have increased it, we've almost tripled it up to 3.1 billion uh, and, uh, going out in 2021. Uh, that being said, our transportation industry has also responded and uh, they're completing more work year after year uh, and they're meeting groundbreaking levels as well uh, today with 1.7 billion completed annually now versus uh, 500 million in previous years. So when we worked with the, the legislature on, on, on what we were going to do with these gas tax uh, funds, uh, they basically were broken out into four categories, safety, paving, bridges, and interstates. Um, Unfortunately, safety, our safety rating is, is abysmal. We're the, we have the highest fatality rate in the nation. That's something that we, we are focused on. From a paving standpoint, our sing, single largest area of underinvestment over the last 30 years has been on, has been on resurfacing. And, uh, and our roads are showing. Um, while we're making progress, uh, it took us 30 years to get our roads into this condition. It's, it, it's not going to happen overnight, but, uh, but we are working on it. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, bridges. Uh, we are targeting our structurally deficient and low restricted bridges uh, throughout the state. Um, you know, having, having school buses and fire trucks and uh, including freight and other heavy vehicles having to take detours because of structurally deficient bridges isn't good for the economy or the state. So we are focused on that. And then, and then last but not least, uh, with, with our booming economy, we were focused on the interstates and I'll touch base on that a little bit later in the presentation. So from a 10 year investment plan, um, you know, we're putting the money to work. Uh, four out of the, the five areas, we have over doubled the growth of investment. Um, going from uh, on your payments, going from, from less than 300 million annually, we plan to go to, to over 700 million annually to put on our paving projects in a year. Uh, if you'll notice 60% of our funding is going to get in everything to state of good repair with, uh, with the bridges, the paving and, and the saving uh, 
the safety projects. And then finally, you have the, uh, the areas where you have the interstates and the other highway widenings, which is going towards uh, congestion. You see the significant uh, uh, growth on the interstate widenings. That being said, you've got the other highway widenings up there. So what is that 138? That, one, that 138 million annually is the funding that goes to our planning partners, being the Metropolitan Planning Organizations or MPOs and the councils of governments, uh, which is for, for the rural areas. That funding has not changed. And those groups are the groups helping us determine what projects need to be widened to reduce congestion in those areas, getting input uh, from, from our, our local planning partners. That is something we need to address. Um, we recently did an analysis and determined that we needed an additional $100 million in that, in that area annually. So where, where is the, you know, how are we doing with the, with the gas tax trust fund? Um, uh, I think there's been some speculation out there that, that we haven't been spending money. Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you different. Um, so far, uh, we've received uh, close to 1.69 billion and we've turned that around and put that towards projects. With 189 million uh, in payouts made and and 890 in payment payouts remain. Uh, road and bridge projects are done very similar to, you know, if you had a, a contractor building a house, we're not gonna pay that contractor everything up front. Uh, we will we'll, we'll work with that contractor and, and pay as we go. And uh, we will inspect that, that work to make sure we're getting a good quality product. So where is that money gone so far? So, so far we've spent close to 1.3 billion in resurfacing, another 162 million in rural road safety, 259 million in interstates and an additional 18 million uh, towards the bridges. So, so pavement conditions, how, how are they improving? Well, um, we're tracking all of our performance on all of these categories. And uh, for pavements, uh, it's no different. If, you, if you're not measuring, you're just practicing, in my opinion. So we've, we've seen a, a big increase. Uh, we've seen positive returns on all of our different networks, uh, ranging from 7% to, to 19%. Most notably, if you will look at our major road pavement improvements, we've got an increase in 19% there. That isn't, uh, we haven't seen those improvements by by fault, that, that is intentional. Um, while that system only carry, you know, only has roughly about 9,500 center line miles throughout the state, it almost carries 50% of the traffic throughout the state. Uh, our interstates as well, that, that carries, while it's only 851 miles, it carries close to 30%. So just those two networks uh, carry roughly about 80% of the traffic uh, throughout South Carolina. And there you'll see where we're spending the additional money, 82 million on the neighborhood streets, 100 million uh, annually on our farm to market, and uh, the 230 on your, your major road uh, projects, which are those are typically your, your primary routes. And then of course, 150 on your interstates. All right, earlier I mentioned uh, that South Carolina has the highest uh, rural fatality rate in the nation. Uh, during our analysis, we had determined that 30% uh, of our fatalities and serious injury crashes only occurred on 5% of our network. So what do I mean by, by rural roads? Uh, rural roads isn't necessarily your farm to market type roads. I, 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 in this category, uh, rural roads could be interstates. It, it could be primary routes. And uh, a lot of these are these segments that we have located are, are on those routes. So we're we're using a lot of tools that are in the toolbox to help um, to improve those safety uh, corridors, uh, including improvement in paint, reflectors, signage, uh, rumble strips, paved shoulders, um, uh, also moving ditches, clearing the, the, the clear zone, so to speak, to, our, to, our, to the end of our right-of-way line. Uh, one of the major things that we see when we have these fatalities, one of the major causes is hitting fixed objects. So, so getting clearing that clear zone is, is very important. 
you know, earlier I mentioned uh, tracking our performance. So how are we doing on, on our, our safety projects and our bridge projects? Our 10 year target goal was a thousand miles. We'll, we're a little bit over 50% on our rural road safety projects at 559 miles. Our, our bridge projects, we have targeted 465 bridges to get replaced in the 10 year span. Right now we're, we're right on target at 41% with uh, 190 bridges that have gone out to construction. Uh, we have a very aggressive interstate widening program. Um, if you kind of look back prior to 2014, um, we probably, for the 10 years prior to that, we probably only had roughly about four interstate projects that were on board. Uh, when, when Act, Act 98 was approved by the legislature, uh, we were able to, to expedite that. And right now we, we have a very aggressive program. Our two main targets are to, to reduce the bottlenecks in our urban areas, as well as the second one would be for the key rural segments needed for rural freight, upgrading our, our rural segments of our interstate. So on the bottlenecks in our urban areas, we've got three major projects. The first one was I-85-385. Uh, that was completed a little bit over a year ago uh, at, at the tune of $325 million. And here in Columbia, uh, I believe everybody knows Malfunction Junction. Uh, this project, as, along with projects or, or interstates leading into Malfunction Junction, totals approximately 2.4 billion. Uh, the first phase of Malfunction Junction is actually going to be let uh, later on this month. And then last but not, not least, uh, down in the Charleston area, uh, we have the, uh, the interchange at I-26 and 526, including the widening of existing 526. Uh, that is at the tune, the estimate of that is approximately four to six billion dollars. Then next for our, our, our rural segments that we're focusing on, uh, Senator Clymer touched on I-85, that's up there in the top, top left-hand corner. Uh, that's currently under construction. Also, that, those, those projects approximately $830 million. Uh, our other focus is closing the gap between Columbia and Charleston. Uh, the estimate of that is $2.2 billion. We have a, a couple of segments that are underway from a development standpoint in Orange there. Uh, the next segment, I believe, is about a 15-mile segment from Columbia to Orangeburg is under development as well as the next segment from uh, Jedburg Road to SD27, which is where the, the Vault, new Volvo interchange is located. Uh, that's currently under development as well. And there's a small two to three mile segment between Nexton Parkway and Jedburg that's currently under construction. And then uh, then finally down uh, on I-95, we've, we've identified the first 33 miles at an estimate of 935 million uh, to, to widen I-95. The first eight mile segment, the US 278 from the Georgia state line is currently under development. That US 278, that's the exit that you would get off on to go to, go to Hilton Head. And then we've got the other pink areas that, that we do have identified, including uh, the last segment on I-85 to be widened from the Clemson exit to the Georgia state line. And then the, the next 10 miles heading uh, southward towards Columbia on I-77. I believe that is from um, where is it? exit 65 to exit 75. And then uh, Senator Clymer mentioned this as well. I'm gonna to attempt to share y'all uh, our project viewer website. And this website is where you can uh, go and identify those projects.
hopefully everybody can can see the the project viewer on, on, on our website there uh, this is where you can go out throughout the state and, and look at projects in your county or any area of the state and uh and zoom in on them give me a second here So in York County, you've got the, the various projects. You can zoom in, tie on one of these projects and pull up the link. So if you've got any questions about the status of the project, including who is managing the project and their contact information, all that stuff is, is right there for, for, you, for you to view. So let me go back to the presentation. Okay, hopefully that went smoothly. All right, so er earlier I mentioned uh, MPOs and COGS, uh, those planning. Did that work? Okay, so I, I mentioned uh, MPOs and COGS and uh, 138 million. Of, we needed an additional 100 million uh, a year towards that program. Um, so, so for, for York County, um, You've got the RFATS MPO and you, that handles the projects for the urban area. Uh, and then you have the Catawba COG, which handles the projects for, for the rural area. Y'all are both, excuse me, York County is, uh, is fortunate to have uh, Randy Emler and, and David Hooper working on them. They've been able to stretch the dollar uh, on funding in that area. They do a great job. Uh, that being said, our FATS only receives approximately six million annually, and uh, Catawba Cog uh, receives almost five million annually. That doesn't go very far. Um, a, a typical, to put that in perspective, a typical intersection project is going to range anywhere between a, a million to three million dollars. A a widening project is, is is going to range anywhere from seven to ten million dollars a mile. Uh, interstate widenings. Uh, which the COGS and MPOs typically do not do, they can range anywhere from 10 to 30 million a mile, depending on the terrain, how many interchanges and bridges are, are within that segment. So um, uh, my, my point is, is, is that money doesn't go as, as, as far as we would like it. Projects to come uh, that they haven't started working on in the RFATS area include Meeting Street from Dave Lyle Boulevard to Galleria Boulevard. Uh, at an estimate of 3.5 million. And then you've got US 21 from the Catawba River uh, to SC 160, the estimated price tag on that is, is, is $30 million. In the, in the uh, Catawba Cog region, they're currently working on an intersection project uh, at SC 161 at US 321. Uh, estimated project cost is 2.5 million. Uh, preliminary engineering is ongoing with right away acquisition to start uh, this fall with construction starting a year after. And I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention the York County Pennies for Progress uh, program uh, that has been very helpful in that area. Uh, it was the first of its kind in the state. I believe they're on round four now. Um, I've just pulled this from their website showing a list of the projects they have in their area. But uh, I can tell you by, by having that pennies for progress in that area, it has helped both uh, the RFATS MPO and the Catawba COG uh, stretch their dollars. And then finally, I want, I want to touch on, on public transit opportunities. Right now we're working with Connect and Beyond. This is uh, uh, on, a, on a study, which is a, a two-state, 12 county sponsored study by the Central Central Line of Regional Council. Uh, this, this is in the Charlotte region. Uh, and we're working towards uh, developing a plan there. 
That's my understanding that preliminary uh, findings should be coming uh, towards uh, the, the end of this year. So we are focused on that. Uh, from a, a statewide perspective, um, right now, as far as light rail or bus rapid transit, there isn't any in the state. Um, Charleston County is currently working on a bus rapid transit project. Uh, that, that project is estimated, I believe, a little bit over 400 million, but that but they are helping to fund that project. I think at the tune of somewhere between 100 and 200 million uh, of that and looking for additional funding coming from, uh, from the federal government to help uh, expedite that project. With that, I believe that is all that I have unless anybody has any questions. And again, thank you for having me uh, this morning. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me, Brent? Can you hear me, uh, Wes? I can. Yeah, I can hear you. Fantastic. Well, the first question that came in, uh, Brent, you touched on it a little bit, and that was the study coming out for light rail and, pot and potential mass transportation and partnering with Charlotte, especially in York County, uh, with the growth that's uh, occurring in York County. And when you look at the commuters uh, that are going either up to Charlotte or down to York, York County. Uh, so you did mention that the study's uh, coming out soon. So the question is, is do you have any additional insight? And for Senator Clymer, the question is, is this something that uh, uh, you would support uh, just knowing what you know now at this point in time? We'll start with you, Brent. Yeah, well, you know, we're working on the study. I, I would say, you know, Charleston area is probably going to be the first that has, you know, a bus rapid transit. Uh, that being said, uh, with Charlotte being just above York County, uh, my, my projection would be that, that the York County area would be the next to have some type of either light rail or bus rapid transit system in the area. So uh, that's something we're working towards. Uh, congestion's not going away. We've got to look at other uh, opportunities uh, and, and definitely bus rapid transit and, and light rail is another, another alternative that we need to look at to help get uh, uh, truck and, and car traffic off of our roads. Senator Clymer? Yeah, so I think, um, can, can you hear me okay? Um, I, mean, I, I think substantially the answer to that question depends on the level of federal investment available for that kind of project, right? I mean, we, we talked about, or at least in the, the, the second slide that I showed, demonstrated the, um, you know, our, our, the nature of our transportation network, even if we made, you know, significant road investments. And I think we have to make those road investments. And I don't think that, um, you know, transit should supplant those, road investments, but to the extent that federal funding is available for this project, I mean, it's obviously the case that we can't uh, outbuild our growth. Uh, and so it's something we'd have to look at. It's gonna, uh, I think the, the data needs to be supportive of that kind of investment. And my suspicion is that when the data comes in, it will be. Okay. And uh, the next question uh, is going, Brent is going back to your slide that showed the state spending uh, to from our neighbors compared to South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is the answer money or is the answer more in line with prioritization, uh, working smarter, new products, et cetera? Oh, I mean, we, we, based on our 10 year plan, we have everything prioritized based on those categories. Uh, but all of our projects, we, we identify, they go through the analysis, they are ranked in accordance with Act 114. So prioritization, I, I don't feel is necessarily, you know, the issue at the end of the day, funding to, 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 to let these projects out, the cost of projects have, have gone up. And, uh, and until 2017, when the gas tax was, was passed, it was just hard to, um, 
you know, work on these projects with a budget that was last in, increased since 1986. So uh, we, we got a little bit of a backlog, but uh, we're, we're working towards that to try to get our system to a state of good repair. Okay, and then Senator Clymer, I have a feeling this one would be a follow-up uh, to that answer, uh, which relies around if DOT's got the prioritization right, if the work's going where it's going, but we're still underspending, is there an appetite in the General Assembly to increase uh, funding uh, to DOT? I think there should be. Uh, I mean, transportation is a core function of government. And coming into this budget cycle, the, according to the revised figures you know, released in the last couple of weeks, um, the General, General Assembly has for the budget this year, 386 million in new recurring dollars, 1.7 billion in new non-recurring dollars, held back about 500 million uh, in excess reserves last year, have 525 million plus or minus, uh, from the Department of Energy settlement and $2.1 billion from the most recent federal stimulus package. And so the state is just awash in money uh, and it would be a terrible disappointment if some substantial portion of that funding or that money didn't make its way into that core function of government, which is fixing our transportation network. And I got a question uh, on pennies for progress. And I think it goes without saying pennies has been just a, a gold star project for your county and really pulled us out of the ditch when you consider uh, the budgeting for DOT back at the time the first pennies came around. Is there a sense of whether or not this is an ongoing model uh, for funding of roads within York County, or would you rather see a, uh, a bigger budget in DOT uh, versus uh, a localized tax? Same. Both. Um, I mean, we, in York County, we are, we are growing so much, um, so fast that absent the, the pennies program, you know, as bad as things can be at times here, I mean, they would be just stunningly worse uh, to, to the point of being borderline unlivable. And so I think if, um, I mean, we would be wise to continue with the program, provided that it's delivering on, on projects uh, economically, which I believe it is currently. And uh, the state needs to step up and invest more. I, I note in, uh, you know, more than, more than once a year in, in meetings with Secretary Hall, I always point out the fact uh, that the counties around the state that have a, uh, you know, penny for their road projects, uh, they are doing work that the state would otherwise do on its prioritization list, right? So if, if, if our penny is funding the projects that would otherwise rank very high up on the state's list, then that means that the locals are doing the work that the state would otherwise have done. And therefore that the state's funding mechanism really ought to account for the fact that certain counties around this state are stepping up to the plate in a much bigger way than others. And we ought to be bonused in terms of our allocation of state road dollars for the fact that we are stepping up and performing functions that would otherwise be performed by the state. And I think it's, it's also worthy of mentioning that pennies has passed overwhelmingly in your county. Uh, this hasn't been a, a squeaker uh, or controversial uh, for that matter. And, uh, and the citizens of York County have spoken loud and clear that pennies yeah. is a good investment. I voted for it every time. I mean, it's a, it's a, good, pro it's a good program. As well. <laughs> um, uh, Brent, this uh, next question goes to you, and I, I think you raised a few, few eyebrows when you talked about the uh, fatality percentage for, uh, percentages for South Carolina. And the question is, can you go into a little more detail on how roads can be made safe um, outside of just uh, paving or widening? 
Well, we, we try to take a strategic approach when we look at the analysis tool and the, the, the incident data and, and things of that nature. But there, there are various tools. I mentioned some of them. But, you know, uh, on our interstates, you will see a lot of uh, clear zone clearing. Uh, as I mentioned, the um, hitting a fixed object is, is the number one by far reason for, for, for fatalities or serious injuries. So by, by reclaiming that right away and, and clearing that clear zone, uh, that's probably the number one way. Uh, but also, uh, when I say widening shoulders or paving shoulders, also paving those shoulders because you know, one, one thing the person, the driver does is pull off the roadway. Well, we want to make sure that they can stay on the roadway to start off with and then have, have time to be able to do that without hitting the Excuse me, a fixed up. Okay, you locked up on my screen, Brent, but you're back. So uh, did you finish okay. your answer for everybody to hear? <laughs> Yeah, well, um, there, there, there are numerous ways, and I mentioned some of those, but uh, uh, one of the biggest components from a uh, fatalities and serious injuries is hitting a fixed object. So by clearing our clear zones uh, and reclaiming our right of way, which you've seen a lot on our interstate segments of clearing the medians, uh, that, that, that is probably the number one uh, way to, to help reduce fatalities and serious injuries. That being said, uh, that can be a little expensive as well. So we're looking at rumble strips, paving uh, additional shoulders because you know one of the first um, ways that, that people will basically hit that fixed object is basically getting off the roadway and not being able to get back on. So by, by, by giving them a little bit of additional width from a paving standpoint, just by paving those shoulders will give them time to to get back on to within their uh, within their lane. Well, I'm glad you explained the clearing uh, program because I'll I'll have to admit I I knew it had to be about safety, but that was a head scratcher for me going down the interstate the first couple of times when I saw the crews out there cutting and and pushing everything uh, further back. I knew it had to be around safety, but thank you for uh, explaining that in a little more detail. Yeah, it's. It, I think it was eye-opening to a lot of people on, on the interstates when you're traveling down the interstates, and once we cleared that clear zone, and you look at, at the drop-off, this basically six-to-one slope there, going 65, 80 miles an hour, you pull off that roadway, there's no way to recuperate. You're going into that ditch, and if there's a, a fixed object there, you're going to hit it, and there's going to be, unfortunately, some 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 serious uh, injuries uh, because of it. Without a doubt. And right now we're talking about things that DOT is doing, but I think we could also take a lesson in that, that we all need to drive defensively. We need to be safe. We don't need to be in a hurry out there. We need to uh, watch our uh, following distances and just uh, not be texting and driving, distracted driving, et cetera. We can help DOT uh, ourselves as drivers. Gentlemen, um, we're coming to the end here, but what I'd like to do is give you each a minute or so to kind of wrap up and hit anything that you're thinking, man, I wish I would have expanded on this, or I wish I would have touched on this a little bit more, or based on some of the questions, maybe you want to uh, you want to add a little bit. So Brent, we'll start with you, sir, and um, go ahead and give us a closing, please. Uh, yeah, well, well, first and foremost, we're... we're, we're um, we're very grateful for, for what the legislatures uh, have, have done for us, us to date. We're putting that money to work. Um, again, we are prioritizing those projects based on uh, those categories that, that, that you said we were going to address and we're addressing. Uh, that being said, going back to my first bullet, um, you know, we're, we're making progress to a state of good repair. That being said, that, that congestion piece is is still yet to be resolved. It's something that we're working towards and, and, and we look forward to working with York County, uh, the MPO and the COG uh, and, and the progress for, for pennies uh, to, to moving that forward. Thank you, Senator Clymer. 
First, let me just reiterate my, my gratitude for being included in the conversation today. It's always good to reconnect with our chamber friends and um, look forward to doing it again in, in person soon. And, and also want to thank Brent. Thank you. That, that was incredibly informative. We're grateful that you uh, took the time to jump on and share with us a lot of that data. That The information that, that Brent shared comes substantially from a, a report that uh, Secretary Hall delivered to the Senate Transportation Committee a couple weeks ago, and um, I, I, and I would say that it reflected in that in a lot of those numbers is significant progress. Is it is it where we need to be? Is it uh, are we are we waving the mission accomplished banner? No, but progress is underway both around the state and as as we saw on some of the slides that I shared, uh, significant investment is happening in York County. Uh, I think just looking out into the future and some other issues to keep on the radar are, uh, number one, um, what happens, uh, how permanent are some of the post, or, you know, the, the COVID related changes in the, the way people work? And, and what does that do to our transportation network? I mean, if people are working more from home, uh, how does that shift the manner in which we invest in transportation infrastructure, number one? Number two, I'm really interested to, to see, you know, several automakers have said that they will be electric only by 2035, 2040, something like that. And so as, as we've all discussed and we all know, our uh, transportation infrastructure is funded substantially through the gas tax, you know, the user fee uh, paid at the pump. And so as more and more vehicles uh, are not stopping at a pump, but are instead plugging up to an electrical outlet, uh, the manner in which the state funds critical infrastructure uh, obviously is going to have to evolve with that. And so those are two sort of big issues on the horizon that the data from which we, you know, or we just don't, we, just, we know we don't know. The known unknown, is, as Donald Rumsfeld might have said. Uh, but I think those will be fun conversations to have going forward. And again, thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to share with you this morning. Thank you. And once again, folks, that was uh, Deputy Secretary Brent Ruiz with SCDOT, Senator Wes Clymer. And we also want to thank York County government, who was the sponsor of this particular session. Thank you, gentlemen. We really appreciate your time and sharing it with uh, our more than 800 chamber members and all those who decided to log in today and watch. Uh, we're going to take a break, folks, and we're going to be back here again at 1.30 p.m. to talk about education and employment with Representative Ray Felder and South Carolina Superintendent of Education, Molly Spearman. Thank you very much.